the first question we have to ask is, what is the French theological turn? And then work backwards to asking, what is phenomenology and how does it relate to that? So the first thing we should say, what is the French theological turn? Well, it is the major source of new phenomenological research, in many ways the major source of new philosophical research in France, right? And it is the contemporary inheritor of much of the European philosophical tradition. So in a very general way, this is what's happening now. That's what the theological turn is. Okay, but that doesn't really enlighten the concept too much. So let's talk about what specifically is novel about it. Well, it's a new way of addressing theological questions, not from the basis of any pre-given or uh, pre-understood concepts of the divine, but beginning with uh, concrete existence. In other words, it tries to answer some of the age-old philosophical, I mean, theological questions uh, by not beginning with some ideal content, something like the idea of God, but with the real or actual existence as we encounter it day to day. In this way, it tries to employ the philo philosophical systems of Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger, the founders of phenomenology, uh, as a new platform for leaping into theological discussion, right? It's this a way of avoiding sort of the traditional uh, jumping off point, which would be scripture and tradition, right? Now, this may strike some of you as not terribly novel, especially those of you in uh, the theology department. Uh, because this is something, after all, which I think someone like Augustine attempted uh, in his work, right? So, for example, in uh, his um, essay on uh, free will and grace, right, when Augustine goes about asking, well, how do we know uh, that there is a God, and what do we mean when we say that there is such a God? He doesn't begin with scripture, nor does he begin with some um, sort of abstract assertion uh, to what the nature of God's existence would be. He says, let's begin with our own existence, right? Let's start by examining what, what we are and who we are. And of course, you know the beginning of the Confessions, which begins with the statement, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. The, the idea being that we understand God on the basis of our own restlessness rather than on the basis of some abstract theological concept. In this regard, it's not new uh, within philosophy, uh, but it is new uh, within contemporary thought. Uh, and it's, it is novel... Um, uh, in a sense, after Augustine. But we could say that Augustine uh, was avant la lettre, as we say in French, sort of before, be, before his time, a proto-phenomenologist of some sort. Uh, but I want to say that it's particularly novel within phenomenology, the field that I work in, uh, and the field that uh, we address as we move backwards from the la end of the title of my talk to the beginning. So the question is, why is that? Well, to understand that, we have to understand a bit of the history of the phenomenological movement. Am I going too fast for anyone? No? Okay, good. Again, this is meant to be very generous, uh, introductory, very relaxed. So also, at any point, if it gets uh, a bit confusing, uh, just raise your hand. I mean, this is a, a colloquium, right? It's a, a chance for us to meet as minds. So, All right, so let's talk a bit about phenomenology and why this would be a novel approach within phenomenology. Well, since the beginning of the phenomenological movement, right, which would be around the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Phenomenology is really seen as a 20th century movement, even though its roots and origins are really at the end of the 19th century. The question of the existence of God and the nature, of the value, the nature and the value of faith have been famously set aside. Now, set aside is actually the technical language employed by the founder of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, philosophy at the time that Edmund Husserl came about had gotten, uh, in his words, uh, needlessly idealistic, meaning that uh, we, it had started tarrying with uh, ideal content uh, rather than actual real existence. Uh, you know, this is probably famously illustrated by the sort of arcane debates which were taking place, uh, not to point fingers, uh, in medieval philosophy at the time, right? And, and which had been, been taken up by some uh, modern philosophers. You know, questions like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, these sorts of, uh, of silly questions, right? Uh, we'll allow the medievalists to defend themselves later, uh, <laughs> if at all. <clears throat> Now, Edmund Husserl uh, championed his uh, philosophical movement with a battle cry back to the things in themselves, back to reality, back to concrete existence. Well, in the progress of, of this movement, he then felt that, well, anything 
which doesn't uh, fit into reality as we experience it, reality as it appears to us, must be temporarily set aside or bracketed. That doesn't mean we're not going to uh, talk about these questions or that uh, they're completely invalid. It just means uh, until we've gotten back to these, the reality and understood this thing, we have to kind of set them aside, right? So he says, in a sense, the essence of doing real philosophy is setting aside traditionally metaphysical questions. Metaphysics, of course, was seen traditionally as first philosophy, the very most important thing, the basic thing. Husserl wanted to throw metaphysics out the window, right? So let's give an example. What's a classic metaphysical question when we talk about, for example, this table? The classic metaphysical question is, how do I know that the table is beyond my perception of the table? There's an assumption that there's a distinction between the table as it appears to me which, which we could call the phenomenal table, and the table as it actually is, which we could call the noumenal table, to use the classic Kantian distinctions. Well, Husserl thought that this distinction was a bit arcane, abstract, and, and silly. Why presume, Husserl would ask, that there is such a thing as the real noumenal table beyond my phenomenal experience of the table? Isn't what I mean by the word is, isn't what I mean by existence simply that something appears to me? So let's toss this sort of metaphysical baggage out the window and let's replace our understanding of being with phenomena. Being is that which appears. Being in any way, right? Either visually, auditorily, for example, a song, right, in taste. Something is in as much as it appears to me, right? In this way, Husserl redefined uh, existence, being itself, with the phenomenal and not with the noumenal as it had been traditionally held in philosophy. But of course, this presents a problem for people of faith. How so? Well, God doesn't ever appear as such. There is no discrete phenomena that we can point to and say, that is God. As a result, God, along with all the metaphysical baggage of the noumenal realm, gets, in a sense, thrown out the window. God can't be talked about within phenomenology. It has to be purely a subject of faith, Husserl says, which is beyond the realm of philosophical talk. And he means it in a kind of relegatory sense, right? When he says it's merely the subject of faith, this is his way of saying of nonsense, really, right? Uh, so c c does this make sense how, by uh, redefining being in this way, uh, God all of a sudden becomes something which is not, is not a being, right? So, Husserl goes so far as uh, in doing this, right, uh, as to even uh, in his 1929 Sorbonne lectures, which were famously entitled uh, Descartes' Meditations, and he, he organized them, six lectures in a row, each lecture to deal with one of the famous six meditations of Descartes. When he got to the third meditation, which is famously, you know, the meditation in which Descartes treats the existence of God, he didn't mention the, the word God once in this lecture. So it, it's quite interesting in, in the sense that he felt like he was really taking up Descartes' mantle of, uh, of doing proper philosophy and not doing sort of this weird theology, starting with things themselves, how they exist, our own appearance of existence. But he, he drops God entirely from the picture. So this is how much uh, the concept of God was set aside or bracketed in Husserl's philosophy. Okay? Uh, you'll remember that, um, just to kind of return briefly, uh, Rajiv's paper that he presented last year was saying, well, wait a second, let's not go so quickly. Maybe there is room for God in Husserl's philosophy after all. So he was trying, in a sense, to find wiggle room uh, for the theological within Husserl. So that was what was novel about his paper for those of you who attended. Okay. Now, this uh, critique of theology and this way of doing philosophy, which we're now calling phenomenology, right, dealing with the phenomena, the things in themselves, was taken up by Husserl's premier student, Martin Heidegger, right? Uh, so Heidegger, now, of course, there is some debate on how much Husserl, I mean, Heidegger remains true to Husserl's um, distinctions, but let's, let's, for the moment, assume that um, Heidegger is a phenomenologist in the, in the sense that Husserl uh, is talking about. But Heidegger goes even further uh, than Husserl in his critique of theology, in his critique of the divine, in his critique of what we would call a philosophy of religion. Because not only does he think that the content of God should be set aside, right? he thinks that the very idea of God is ridiculous in the way in which we typically conceive of it. 
This comes across most clearly uh, in his 1943 essay on Nietzsche and his 1957 essay entitled Identity and Difference. But probably the best way to explain it is to start with a very fundamental concept within Heidegger's philosophy. Heidegger says, okay, in the course of talking about what it means for something to be, what it means for something to exist, like the table, we have to make a distinction between what we mean by the word being. Right? He says, typically, the word being can be thought of in two ways. Right? This he calls ontological difference. Right? The first way is as something actually is, right? A, a thing which appears, a table, a boot, uh, a, a person, uh, a, a, you know, etc., a hammer, uh, whatever, what, what have you, a painting. The second way we tend to use the word being is not as one particular entity which may appear, but as the horizon or backdrop of all entities which appear. This word he, he distinguishes by calling uh, being and he capitalizes it, big B being. So in a sense, everything which is, is in as much as it uh, appears on the background of being as a whole, right? big B being. <coughs> Now, this is a fairly traditional distinction within the history of philosophy to some regard, right? This is, in a lot of ways, uh, Heidegger's way of taking up um, Plato's distinction, right, between things and their form, right, things and their ideas. But Heidegger goes one step further because he says, well, look, when we're talking about being, of course, the only thing which properly is, in as much as we, what we mean by the word is, is the entity itself. This big B being, which we assume is the backdrop upon which all particular beings appear, isn't. It doesn't exist. In fact, the, the very condition by which things appear uh, is the fact that this backdrop or this horizon differentiates itself from that which appears. So things appear as that which is precisely because their horizon is not. Right? So he says, well, of course, this presents a very uh, big problem for people of faith. Why? Well, twofold. You can now conceive of God in one of two ways if you want to assert that God is. Either you assert that God is in a very real way, in the same way that a boot, a tree, or a person is, in which case, he says, you reduce God to being an entity like any other entity. Uh, according to Heidegger, this is the tradition of Western metaphysics, and he calls it onto-theology. Uh, right? It's a way of doing theology about beings. But he says, but this is a, to, to make, to, to kind of degrade the being of God, right? God is just like a chair except bigger. Or God is just like a hammer except uh, with infinite properties. He says, so this is, this is, a, this is obviously a, a kind of um, idolatrous conception of God. So clearly this is not what they mean. So he says, well, what Christians must then mean by God is not a being as an entity, but being as the backdrop of all particular entities. But he says, but of course, if that's the case, then your God is nothing. Your God doesn't exist, right? So in a sense, Heidegger goes a lot further than Husserl in his critique of uh, philosophy of religion and theology, uh, because aside from simply setting God uh, 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 aside or bracketing the concept of God, he really wants to sort of twist the knife in God's heart, right? Uh, and say, look, this concept of God is just, it's, it's nothing, right? Okay. Um, this sets a background within the phenomenological tradition for a very hardcore atheism, right? And it makes sense that Sartre, who saw himself as the inheritor of the thought of Husserl and Heidegger, would, you know, carry this into a kind of existentialism which says, you know, the world is meaningless and empty and there is no God and all you can do is launch yourself into the abyss on your own ground. And Camus, you know, statements that when one realizes the true nature of phenomenon, they're faced with only one choice to kill themselves or not. You know, these very sort of lovely sentiments that should be on Hallmark greeting cards. <laughs> and are. <laughs> In France. Okay. It's <laughs> a so great country. They have baguettes and chocolate and uh, very depressing greeting cards. Uh, I have a collection of them. I'll show you. All right. <clears throat> but this sets the stage for what uh, we're examining today, which is this so-called theological turn. Right? And now uh, the true meaning of this word makes sense. Right? Which is what? It's a turn towards theology within the tradition of phenomenology. Um, in a sense, it's the resurrection of God as a topic of possible discourse, but on a new ground, on the ground of uh, all the philosoph uh, philosophical assumptions of phenomenology. Okay. 
Now, this resurrection or this turn towards theology has a, a very uh, interesting and illustrious history, which I'll just mention briefly for those of you who are who are. Uh, know a little bit about this. It was motivated uh, primarily by two French uh, thinkers, Jean Val and uh, Jean Hippolyte, both uh, expositors of the philosophy of uh, Hegel in uh, France. They saw themselves as really uh, the two thinkers who introduced Hegel to, along with uh, another guy, uh, Kojiev, uh, introducing Hegel to French thought. Uh, they had such illustrious students as uh, Jean-Paul Saint, Manuel Levinas, Gabriel Marcel, um, um, uh, Jacques Lacan, so a lot of uh, people studied with these two uh, men. Jean Voile himself had an interesting uh, pedigree. He studied with Bergson, uh, who of course was seen as uh, resurrecting theology in the French Academy in his time. Uh, but it's not so much Jean Voile and Jean Hippolyte who started the French theological turn, uh, but more so uh, the students of Jean Voile, and primarily Emmanuel Levinas, uh, who I'll talk to you about briefly. Um, Levinas, uh, of course, is the subject of uh, the bulk of my interests. I've just uh, written a book on Emmanuel Levinas, which I can uh, take the good news to share with you here that it seems tentatively is going to be published with Duquesne University Press. Um, so we just got that news recently. Um, so uh, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, was, I'll give you a brief biographical sketch, and then I'll talk about how he went about sort of resurrecting God within the phenomenological tradition. Uh, his dates, in case you're interested, are 1906 to 1995, so he's very, very contemporary. He was a Lithuanian Jew who was raised mostly in Paris, uh, but he went to Germany in 1928 through 29 uh, to study with Husserl. Right? Uh, Husserl's name was sort of spreading. Husserl had just done the Sorbonne lectures in Paris, and uh, you know, uh, Levinas thought that it would be advantageous for him to go to Germany. While there, he discovered a word of this up-and-coming philosopher who had yet to be translated or, or heard outside of Germany, uh, Martin Heidegger. So Husserl quickly became a devotee to Heidegger uh, and uh, really was the first person to bring Heidegger back into France. Right? Uh, he was also the first person to translate Husserl into French. So in a lot of ways, he really is the door of phenomenology into France. Um, of course, the irony uh, in this, in case you're interested, is that uh, even though he's the one who introduces Husserl and Heidegger into the French uh, philosophical scene, he's also the very person who's going to call into question the, the very foundations of their uh, relationship to the divine. So in a sense, from the very beginning in France, phenomenology, since, since phenomenology is very beginning in France, it's always been already overturned, in a sense. Uh, this is something sort of strange that, that uh, we're interested in. Okay, but what's, what's interesting and distinct about his uh, philosophy is the way that he felt that Husserl had overlooked certain phenomena. Husserl, he wanted to say, look, I think Husserl's method is right. I think we do need to treat being as that which appears. But he says, but there are strange things which appear. There are curious phenomena which seem to betray the very limits of their phenomenality. Now that sounds like a, a, a mouthful. But really what he's trying to say is there are beings which seem to explode infinitely. Right? So even though they appear, they can't be sort of uh, shoved into uh, their box. Right? They're constantly overflowing in their appearance. Right? Not all phenomena are the same. Not all phenomena are like chairs or hammers. There are other kinds of phenomena. For example, and this is Levinas' famous phenomena, the face of another human being. He says the face appears to us otherwise, now this is Levinas' famous thing, than other phenomena, in that the face always overflows, and I'm quoting Levinas here, uh, its phenomenality, always overflows the boundary of its phenomena. Now what he means by that is that the human face can't be reduced to its form. Right? It's more, in a sense, than it appears. Now, uh, again, this sounds all uh, very technical, and he has ways of exploring this, and I'll, I'll talk about those briefly. But really, uh, it's quite basic, and it's something which you all experience every day, right? This is the kind of experience uh, that you hear being expressed by uh, young ladies on uh, Rye Beach in the summertime when they say, don't objectify me, right? Uh, my appearance is more than my body, right? I am more uh, than you're seeing me as, okay? Uh, but of course, we always already intuit that when we look somebody in the face. This is why the human face has a certain power over us. It can make us nervous. It can draw us up short, right? It has a certain ethical power, in fact, Emmanuel Levinas says. And one of the phenomena uh, that he's constantly fond of unpacking for us uh, is the phenomenon of apology in the, in the uh, well, to be redundant, in the face of a face. So he says, for example, when the beggar asks us for money, why is it 
that we always say, I'm sorry. Why is this always our immediate response? Moreover, why is it our response to look away, to refuse to engage with the face of the beggar, right? To not want to see them, right? To put our heads down. He says it seems that the face of the beggar, though a concrete phenomenon, has a power over us which can't be attributed to its sheer phenomenality, to the simple fact that it appears. This indicates, says Levinas, that the, the face of the other carries um, a power or a presence which uh, overflows its finite um, presentation. In a sense, it, buries, it carries what he says, uh, re-invoking the language of, of Descartes, uh, an idea of the infinite. It carries a kind of infinitude in it. Phenomena such as the face, phenomena such as ethical uh, apologia, concern, he says, seems to reveal that even within the phenomenal realm, there is what he calls the trace of God, the trace of the divine, right? That the phenomenal, logic, the phenomenal realm, even though finite and fixed, is in a sense always, and he, this is again to quote Levinas, bleeding towards the infinite. In a sense, what Levinas did by examining these strange and curious phenomena was find wiggle room in the real world for that ideal thing. Not God as idea, but God as actual, real uh, phenomena. Right? Okay. Now, this uh, strange uh, resurrection of God, but within a phenomenological framework, was taken up, and I, th I find this very interesting, by one of Levinas' uh, most uh, brilliant students, uh, a man by the name of Jacques Derrida, who um, I, I imagine you're all very familiar with. Now, why is this ironic? Well, Derrida, for those of you who are unfamiliar with him, is known as the father of deconstruction. A lot of people also call him the father of postmodernism. And postmodernism has been excoriated uh, from the heights uh, as uh, you know, the godless 20th century philosophy that's going to sort of finally you know, uh, make us all heathens and having you know, crazy orgies in the street or whatever it is we'll do. There's no moral fixed code. It's all relative, right? And Derrida was seen as the sort of father of this thought. Now, <coughs> to some extent, this is true. Derrida is uh, the father of deconstruction. And he does work in his philosophy to, uh, to uh, help unpack this word deconstruction break down uh, traditional distinctions, right? Right and wrong, these things. The reason Derrida does this is he felt that it, these distinctions, when we, when we talk about phenomenon in terms of these uh, right or wrong, black and white, inside, outside, what he calls these binary opposites, he says seems to miss uh, these curious phenomena such as the face, which seem to reside on a border between these two things, right? So a face is neither like the idea of God, nor is it like a table, it's sort of between. So only by breaking up these concrete binary distinctions can we really begin to understand these phenomena. In this way, Derrida sought to resurrect what he thought of as a vital understanding of the divine. The divine as a fluid movement which can't be fixed in any one particular concept. Derrida likened himself to Nietzsche, smashing the idols which would try to fix God in one particular concept or form. So Derrida thought of himself indeed as a deeply religious thinker. In fact, his deconstruction and his postmodernism were ways of what he thought re, uh, revitalizing the concept of God. This is uh, wonderfully illustrated by a book uh, um, in a book by a guy named Jack Caputo or John Caputo, who's considered one of the, ama uh, the, the big American uh, proponents of this French theological turn. Uh, the book is entitled The Prayers and Tears of Jacques Derrida. Interestingly enough, uh, Derrida himself was a Jew uh, from Northern Africa uh, who also was sort of an outsider in Paris. Um, indeed, many people have seen this uh, so-called French theological turn as merely a way of translating Jewish uh, mystical thought into the language of Western philosophy. Okay, so here we have Derrida and Levinas breaking down the traditional distinctions uh, regarding the divine um, uh, placed, or in the restrictions placed upon the divine uh, within uh, the founders of phenomenology, Husserl and Heidegger, right? And in a sense, creating room for a reinvestigation into the nature of the divine, but on a phenomenological basis. 
Uh, and this leads me to uh, the fourth and last part of my talk, uh, how this uh, inheritance has been taken up uh, by contemporary thinkers. And I wanted to introduce you to the thought of four uh, contemporary French thinkers, all of whom uh, studied uh, with uh, Levinas and Derrida and uh, see themselves as um, uh, reinvestigating uh, theology, but now on a uh, uh, phenomenological ground. And they are, in a sense, the, um, the hard core of this so-called French theological turn. Um, so just briefly, I'll introduce you to a few of them and, and how they've taken up these thoughts. The first I'll introduce you to is uh, Michel Henry. Uh, his dates are 1922 to 2002. Unfortunately, uh, died very recently. Uh, Michel Henry decided to uh, uh, try to reinvestigate the concept of, of uh, the divine within a th phenomenological framework by investigating what he called um, a material or phenomenological uh, uh, excuse me, a material or um, phenomenology of the flesh. Right? And what he means by this is he says, look, one of the principal proponents of the Christian faith is that God has made man. So God is no mere ideal content, but is in fact a phenomenological content, which can be studied in a very real way. Huh? So uh, he wrote three books uh, sort of exploring uh, the idea and the way in which um, God appears as man and the way in which flesh um, uh, sort of bears a theological reality. Uh, a few of these books are uh, one called Incarnation, a, Phenom a Philosophy of the Flesh. Another one, a very beautiful book entitled I Am the Truth Towards a Phenomenology of Christianity. And a third one, uh, which I think is yet to be translated into English, so this is my translation of the title, uh, Philosophy and Phenomenology of the Body. So this is Michel Henry's way of sort of, again, taking up uh, the project initiated by Levinas and Derrida, uh, but doing it in his own particular way. Another guy who uh, is very interesting in this talk is uh, Jean-Louis Chrétien. Uh, Jean-Louis Chrétien uh, sought to explore religious experience in a phenomenological way, especially the idea of call, solicitation, or address um, as a theologically rich phenomenon. So he wanted to explore, for example, the idea of um, uh, uh, what we would call in the Catholic tradition vocation, right? Or prayer, for example. What is phenomenologically happening in prayer? Right? What's going on? Prayer is a phenomenon. And how does, does this phenomenon sort of reopen uh, a way in which to talk about God? Um, three of his books, again, I just throw these out in case you're interested in them, uh, is a book called The Unforgettable and the Unhoped For, in which he explores uh, the idea of the Messiah. Another one is called Call and Response, in which he uh, talks about vocation and prayer. Uh, and uh, finally, a, a third one, which I love, is called uh, The Nude Voice, A Phenomenology of Promise in which he talks about the way in which speaking is already a sort of theologically fecund phenomenon. Another guy, one of my personal favorites, uh, this guy is named uh, Jean-Yves Lacoste, uh, Father Lacoste, actually. Uh, he initiated what he called a phenomenology of liturgy, an attempt to examine the integral role of ritual in human life as a way of experiencing the divine. So he saw ritual, ritualizing things like funeral, right, uh, or even habits, ticks. Right? Uh, any kind of ritual as uh, as a kind of liturgy, as a way of uh, interacting with the divine on a, on, a, on a daily level. In this way, he, he took Heidegger's concept of being in the world uh, and re-understood it as a kind of being towards God. Every ritual which you engage in in the world, he says, is a way of orienting yourself towards this sort of uh, theological power uh, which we experience concretely in the world, in the phenomenological world. Right? And indeed, uh, he even thought as a way of uh, protecting us from that. Um, Black Coast only wrote one book, but again, I'll give you a title of it uh, in case you're interested. Uh, it's called Experience and the Absolute, Disputed Questions on the Humanity of Man. Again, uh, he saw man as a theological animal. This is how he defines man. So he wants to get rid of this concept of the human uh, and start calling us a, 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 a liturgical animal, he says. Mm. Finally, I'll introduce you to the uh, idea of uh, the, uh, someone who is probably the most important member of this theological turn, uh, Jean-Luc Marion. Jean-Luc Marion is still with us, fortunately. He was born in 1946. Uh, and more than any of his contemporaries, he is seen as uh, the guy who um, has really uh, made progress in uh, finding room for the divine and for theologically fecund ideas within phenomenology. He does this uh, pri primarily uh, through three different ways, which I'll just address to you briefly. The first is by exploring uh, what we call, again, these uh, fecund or these rich phenomena, which he calls saturated phenomena. Uh, his two most uh, uh, 
uh, saturated phenomena, the idea again being that there's more contained in the phenomena than seemingly can possibly be contained. It's sort of supersaturated, right? Um, he uses indeed the scientific idea of supersaturation to talk about this. Uh, three uh, examples of uh, saturated phenomenon he likes to explore are uh, the concept of the Eucharist, right? Uh, the concept of icons, icons as opposed to idols, right? So an icon is it's just it's a picture, right? But it's more than a picture. It does other things than a picture. He says instead of absorbing the gaze of uh, the viewer, like a photo does, where you sort of you're looking at it and you're caught up in it, he says it transports the gaze of the viewer into another realm. Right? And that's uh, why it's again it's saturated. It contains more than it possibly could. Uh, another one of the, the saturated phenomena is, of course, the face. And he really develops Levinas's concept of the face here. The second thing that uh, uh, Jean-Luc Marion does to really reinitiate uh, this theological turn phenomenologically is to explore what we mean by being, what we mean by that which appears. And he does this by resurrecting the ancient German word for being. And uh, uh, I hope Brother Andrew will uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here. But uh, of course, Heidegger has already uh, made overtures towards this, but es gibt sein, right? So, uh, which in German means being given, right? Uh, now, Heidegger talked about this uh, briefly. Um, uh, well, actually, it took to some length in his later philosophies. Uh, but he didn't see it as necessarily a, a, a theologically fecund idea. Marion really takes this up and he says, look, everything which is, is given, is given to us. So every appearance, every being which appears, uh, can, uh, in a sense, have some trace of the given, of the giver, therefore. And finally, and perhaps uh, most extraordinarily, Marion took up the concept of being as the nothing that Heidegger developed, and explored it in terms of understanding God as he who is not. And this is most famously developed uh, in uh, one of his books entitled God Without Being. Right? It's a very rich and wonderful book. Uh, and, and in a sense, what Marion is trying to do is draw upon the ancient uh, uh, mystical traditions of negative theology right, to re, uh, uh, reinitiate a phenomenological uh, concept of God as... Uh, we, so we can't even attribute being to God because even to do such a thing uh, is to create, uh, is to blaspheme him. So we have to talk about as he who is without being, right, or he who is beyond being. Uh, so again, taking up this negative theological tradition where you can't make any uh, positive uh, 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 statements about the nature of God but can only negate uh, things, right? I'll give you two other titles of books in case you're interested. Uh, one is called In Excess, Studies in Saturated Phenomena. Each chapter is a study in a different saturated phenomena. And another one, Being Given Toward a Phenomenology of Givenness. Right. So these are the major figures of the French theological turn. This is its sort of history. This is why it's important to phenomenology. But why is it important to theology uh, or, or, or philosophy uh, as a whole? So whether you're in the phenomenology tradition, phenomenological tradition or not. I think it's important in phenomenology because it, it provides an interesting way of responding to what is really the modern critique of theology and, and philosophy of religion, which is, oh, look, you're, you're talking about nonsense. This stuff is sort of uh, beyond uh, your ability to talk about. It's, uh, it finds a way to talk about these things uh, within a real actual world, not just as ideal contents, but as real potencies, yeah? things which really occur, things which really appear in the world. Uh, so in a sense, it re re uh, reinvigorates um, the philosophy of religion. Uh, so I think that's why it's important to philosophy. Why is it uh, important for theology? Uh, well, I think it provides uh, new pathways to talking about theological content without sort of um, uh, drifting into um, um, obscurism, uh, being too abstract, or uh, without uh, simply having to ground every statement and say, well, that's just tradition. That's the, that's the way we've done it. You can actually start uh, reinvigorating, uh, rethinking how to prove God's existence, for example. Right? Uh, I think, indeed, the phenomenological uh, turn uh, provides uh, rich ground for rethinking the, traditional, uh, the, the Catholic tradition of uh, providing proofs for God's existence. Right? So I think this is what's uh, interesting about this. I, I want to conclude by um, recommending you to some further reading, if you're interested in this. Uh, well, the first is uh, uh, just uh, serendipitous. I was at uh, SPEC this past weekend, which is the Society for Phenomenology and Existential Philosophy. It's sort of our, our big uh, yearly uh, gathering of geekdom. Uh, it's, uh, if you're, if you're in, you know what Trekkie conferences are, this is very, very similar. Uh, people dress as their famous favorite phenomenologists and uh, do role play. Uh, but uh, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh has a yearly lecture series in phenomenology. Uh, it's called the Simon Silverman Lecture Series in Phenomenology. And this year, in fact, as you can see, 
their uh, uh, subject is phenomenology and the theological turn. Uh, so, you know, uh, they're following my lead, obviously. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, uh, Jean-Luc Marion will be coming from uh, the Sorbonne to give a, a talk there. So uh, this is something which uh, you could see. He's a very, very good uh, lecturer. Um, uh, and uh, Richard Kearney from Boston College, uh, those Carney. of you who know. Kearney, thank you. It's that Irish thing. Um, uh, will be uh, 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 responding to Marion's paper. Kearney has, uh, has taken up these things. The other book, uh, for those of you who think this might uh, be all uh, just bunk, or uh, for those of you who think that uh, really this is a complete betrayal of what phenomenology really is, um, could uh, look at this wonderful book uh, by uh, uh, Dominique uh, Jeanco, which is uh, entitled Phenomenology and, notice it's in quotes, The Theological Turn. Um, Dominique Jeanco was a, a, a big criticizer of, of The Theological Turn. She, uh, he felt that... Um, it was not being true to Husserl and Heidegger's original insights. So wrote this uh, uh, um, essay on uh, how it betrayed phenomenology. Uh, and in this uh, edition, which can be uh, got online, it's wonderful because it has uh, Yanko's essay, but then it has responses by um, the major figures within the theological turn, by uh, Chrétien, Jean-François Cotin, uh, michel Henry, Jean-Luc Marion, and Paul Ricoeur. Uh, so, who's also another member. So, it's a, it's a very neat book, uh, both a good way to introduce yourself to the thoughts, if you just skip over Jean Co's uh, essay, uh, or to find some criticism for the thought, if you apologize to the debaters. My worry is, I would want to talk about it, because I'd have to go see how the Japanese respond, and then how uh, some South Pacific Islanders respond to debaters, and how Africans are pretty soon. I'll probably find out that some stare each other down, and some... Uh, I, I mean, how do you know that you got a phenomenon that you can do anything with, or you just you just do it off across you know Western response and all you're talking about? It, it, it depends who you ask. There's two responses to that, of course. I mean, um, <coughs> why don't I, I I'll give what what I would consider to be the more traditional response, and then I, I can give uh, another response. I think the the initial thing is well, look. <coughs> All philosophy is based on certain assumptions, right? The assumption that there are, uh, we are talking about the same thing. Because, of course, the question you ask is, well, for example, how do I know that uh, the phenomenon I'm talking about is the same phenomenon you're talking about? Or that the phenomenon I'm talking about actually occurs in such a way that it appears to all people in the same way? I mean, gosh, at that point when we ask that question, we're asking the exact same question, which is, how do I know that when I use a word, you understand by that word the same thing I do? And I take it that when you start asking those questions, though they're philosophically important questions, you break down fundamentally the ability to do what, what I would call real philosophy in a sense. And the reason is because um, at some point uh, it becomes impossible to know, right? Uh, and I think, I think we, 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 we're, we're very familiar with the, the way in which uh, that can kind of ultimately lead to a kind of uh, sort of goofy skepticism where the only appropriate response I can have to your <coughs> question is to either kick you or ask you to leave, right? Uh, or, or any sort of nonsense I throw out. So I think the first thing is to say, well, there is some assumption that uh, there is a universality to, phenomenal, to, to the phenomenal realm, that there is such a thing as the human, right? And that uh, the human, though it may have different cultural iterations, um, uh, is the same in all things, and that this is a basic human phenomenon. That would be the assumption. And the way to make sure that it is a basic human assumption as opposed to a cultural phenomenon is, of course, to look at the way in which it manifests in all cultures. So, for example, the shame we feel, in, or the response that we have to a beggar, period. Uh, that's Levinas's point. Now, he says, look, it may manifest as shame here. That may be a cultural response. That's true. But the very fact that we can't close ourselves off to the beggar's call, that we feel that we must make a response, right? whether that response be staring them down, cuffing them in the ears, as it may be in the case of BA, or, you know, um, I don't know. <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or, uh, or in my case, uh, you know, uh, crawling up into a corner at home and, and crying in the fetal position because you know that there's nothing you can do to appease their suffering. Okay? We all have our hang-ups. But, um, so, th those are, uh, okay, maybe three different cultural iterations. But the fact remains that uh, when we're confronted with the need of another human being, we must respond. We must make a response. Now, Levinas says this proves that there's a fundamental, now listen to his play on words here, responsibility to the other. Now, that responsibility itself is what he's interested in. What he says is that bears a significance that um, it, it shows that we as human beings are not kind of closed off monads without windows, 
but are fundamentally open to another. But moreover than just open, it shows that the other, in this case the beggar, has a kind of priority over me, can reorient my actions, such that though before I was sort of walking about the street concerned with my own issues, all of a sudden, when confronted by the other, I have to make a response. Even if that response is to sort of, you know, slap them on the head and say, get a real job, you know, or you're a lazy, you know, uh, unproducing member of society. Uh, the very fact that I have to make a response, uh, or even if I choose to ignore, right, I'm choosing to ignore, it's a form of response, shows that uh, the other has a way of redirecting me. In a sense, it, it has more possession over my being and what I'm doing than I do. So, so there's an assumption that this is a universal phenomenon, that though it may take different cultural iterations, it's, it's a universal phenomenon. So that's one way of responding to your question. It's, it's the way I, I would respond. I do believe there is such a thing called the human. I, I do think we share certain common traits. An example uh, I could give, and this may be uh, uh, why I didn't get this job, as a matter of fact. I, I interviewed at Emory uh, last year, and uh, somebody said, well, how do you know that we all experience something? Because I, I wrote my dissertation on longing. How do, we, how do you know we all experience something called human longing? What would you say if I said to you, I've never experienced something called human longing? And my response to the interviewee was, uh, well, I don't know whether to, to pity you or despise you. Because I don't know uh, whether you're lying to me and being polemical or uh, whether and, and you really haven't experienced this, in which case you seem self, sort, somehow subhuman to me. And I would go so far as saying something like that. You know, maybe you're a robot or an animal. And, um, and no offense to you, Bob, but I, th I think certain analytical philosophers do uh, fall within that category. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's uh, one possible response. I do think that there is a basic human phenomenon. Another possible response made by many uh, of the so-called postmodern thinkers is to say, well, look, these sorts of assumptions about universal phenomenon necessarily bear a kind of um, power mo movement, a power discourse, right, as we talked about in the, in the Foucault's thing. I'm exercising my particular Western understanding of what a human is, is on other people. And as indicated, when you don't fit that, I think you're either an animal uh, or you're lying, right? And they go, well, that's clear that you're just a, a sort of power discourse. Uh, and so to do proper phenomenology, it would always have to be what you would be calling sociology, a cultural iteration, right? You're just sort of, or anthropology maybe. You're just exploring this cultural response. And so while it may uh, be uh, fruitful, um, <clears throat> it's only fruitful within a limited context, right? To that I would say, well, that may be true, but in which case all philosophy uh, becomes reduced to this kind of uh, cultural uh, 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 Anthropology. So, in fact, even when we start talking about uh, what are the conditions for truth, or what is it, uh, what 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 is God, uh, these things we, we can only say what are the conditions for truth within my particular socio-cultural context and my particular neighborhood and my particular cultural iteration and ultimately my own mind, right? So, uh, there are two different approaches, uh, and there's two different ways of responding. And, and I, does that help at all? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, Father John. Well, I, I, the I, beg, I beg to return to the beggar. Hmm. Um, the beggar has to respond to me. So I'm not sure what the point is. Uh, humans respond to other humans in all kinds of different situations. So what? I mean, the, the idea that the beggar suddenly has power over me because I, because I have to respond to him, I can turn around and say, but the beggar then has to respond to me, so I have power over the beggar. Oh, well, I, I'd is say it who encounters the one first or what? I mean, it yeah. seems to me that you're not saying anything. Yeah. We all respond to humans. Well, Levinas would say that uh, you're... And that's you're, the phenomenon. Yeah, he'd say that, uh, well, that may be the case, but he'd say you don't know, because you've, you've never been that beggar. You've only ever been you. And since, as we've said, uh, phenomenology kind of beggar, yeah. starts with, what's that? Yeah, you may have been a beggar. Unless I've been a beggar. That's true. But in which case, you've <laughs> only ever been that beggar. You, particularly. You've not been other people, other beggars. And phenomenology, again, it starts with the assumption, right? that uh, what we mean by being are things which appear. But of course that implies something. Appear where? Well, to me. So in a sense, I can't know what it's like to be you. I can't make any assumptions. I can't make that, uh, in a sense, reversible loop of inner subjectivity. I can't assume that what my experiences are before the beggar are similar to the beggar's experiences before me. All I can do is infer based on how beings appear to me. 
So, in fact, uh, Levinas wants to destroy inner subjectivity. He doesn't think that we can assume that the beggar experience, that, that this is simply a Buberian I am thou relationship. In fact, he criticizes Buber. So, are we monads then? What's that? We are monads then when it all comes down. How about this? Monads with windows, though. Yeah, maybe. That's all it is. That's sure, sure. That's a way of putting it. Uh, we are monads, uh, wherein which uh, flashes of light, which could not possibly have appeared from us, uh, occur. And indeed, that's why Levinas really takes up Descartes' uh, philosophy in a, in a very, very real way. Why? What does Descartes say? Well, look. When I perform the philosoph- the reduction, in a sense, let's call it the phenomenological reduction. Descartes doesn't call it that, but who's real does? Of saying I can't be certain about anything, so I'm going to cancel out the world until I can find one thing I'm certain about. And what's the one thing I can be certain about? Well, that I am. Why? Well, because I'm thinking. I'm thinking that I am, so I must be certain about that. But here's something strange. Within this in monadic existence, the I am, something else appears. An idea. What's the idea? The idea of the infinite. An idea which I could not possibly have been the author of. Right? Because how could I ever come up with an idea which could displace me from the center of my own existence. If indeed I am this monad, which is closed off to the other world, how could I come up with something which would have a power over me? Right? Why would I have done that? Uh, but the fact is, I do have this. So that, that means that there has to be this God. Now, extend that now into how Levinas does his phenomenology. Yeah, it's true. Being is always oriented around you. You go about the world orienting things around you, right? I mean, you see things in your perspective. You can't see things from my perspective. And those of us who are in relationships know that uh, you get in problems as soon as you start thinking you uh, know how the other perceives you or sees things, right? Well, I thought you'd like to have tuna noodle casserole to celebrate your birthday. You know? uh, no. Why didn't you ask me? Etc. Okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, but the strange thing is, in that uh, world, as we go through existence, we're constantly being displaced from the center of our existence. So, for example, we can feel ashamed, we can feel sorry, we can feel apology, we can feel responsible to another. This responsibility to the other is analogous for Levinas to that idea of the infinite. Something you discover in your monadic existence that you could not have possibly been the author of. Did, it, that, you know, and, and, and thus that sort of bears the trace out to God. So for him, the other who appears, the beggar, the orphan, the widow, in a sense, is what God was for Descartes. I'm confused though. If the subject of the other is closed off, and yet you claim there is the universal human, then what it's like for you to encounter the beggar must be somewhat like what it's like for me to encounter the thing, or there is no universal. Ah, uh, well, now we're talking about, we're, but we're mixing two different questions there, though. Uh, in the first hand, I was responding to um, uh, uh, the question of uh, how do we know that phenomenology, as a as a tool or as a technique, uh, isn't uh, veering into sort of uh, random sociology. And I didn't want to say. I, I said, look, you've got two different ways in which you can address that question, yeah, sure. and either way is valid. Uh, now, Levinas wouldn't have answered that question in the exact same way. Because Levinas oh, would not say that there is something called the human. Remember? Uh, as I mentioned just then. So Levinas would not say uh, that there is... The, the only universal for Levinas is the I. Which is the sort of, again, to, to talk about it in Heidegger's language, the horizon upon which all things appear. But within that horizon, this thing appears which can't be reduced to the I. Which can displace the I. Right? So Levinas wouldn't actually say that there is the universal. That's Levinas's way of doing it. So e- again, each of these guys are using phenomenology in a new and different way. They're all different angles. So I don't want you to see it. I, I hope I didn't portray it as um, one seamless sort of Hegelian uh, dialectical development. Uh, these guys attack uh, the traditional phenomenology in different ways. There have been different sort of developments outside of that. They each go about it in different ways. So, for example, Marion uh, uh, wants to take up Heidegger's concept of, of being and, and these sorts of things. Uh, so, for him, this concept of the other is not so fecund. Chrétien, on the other hand, does, right? Uh, Marion is much more happy with this kind of idea of a universal. There, there is this thing, you know. Then why is it that, is, it, is the phenomenon, the supersaturated phenomenon, then? Just a, For Mario. A, a, a personal taste. That is to say, what strikes one as supersaturated might strike another as non-supersaturated. So it, this is really just an. Uh, I might feel. I might feel that mollusks are supersaturated. Yeah. Um, 
or, or, or mathematics in, in, in your case. I mean, we've had this conversation, in fact. So it's a great question. And in, in, in a sense, you're directing that question towards Mario, and you're saying, well, look, what's the difference between an icon and a painting? Uh, is the only difference, uh, is the difference inherent to the object itself, or is the difference uh, somehow in my orientation to the object, right? And Marleon would say a little bit of both. Uh, so, of course, uh, you may contemplate an icon and uh, have great uh, religious reverie, right? Uh, other people may uh, uh, go on a, uh, a, a vacation to Greece and buy old icons because they think they're pretty and they can decorate their you know, room with them. Um, <clears throat> but the point is, in any case, uh, you know, but likewise, um, you may look at the, the Eucharist and say, look, this is the, the body of Christ, right? And somebody else may go, that's a piece of bread that you just mumbled some, some goofy phrases over. Okay? Uh, and you may say, well, how do we conceive of that in the Catholic tradition? Is it purely one's orientation to the Eucharist which makes it the body of Christ? Certainly not. Not according to the Catholic tradition, at least, right? It's not simply that you take it in faith that it becomes the body of Christ. It actually is the body of Christ. And yet you realize that only with the eyes of faith can you recognize it to be the body of Christ. Does that make sense? So you say, well, look, this thing actually is saturated, but it's only recognized as saturated through a certain orientation. In a sense, the orientation opens you to recognize the thing itself. This is, for Marion, a way of re-understanding Husserl's uh, phenomenological reduction. Right? How so? Well, Husserl says, look, all the time you perceive things and you think you're perceiving them as they are. So, for example, I may see this and you may see this, and we go, well, what is that? That's a watch. He goes, well, that's not actually what appears. What appears is a certain silver uh, surface which is reflecting towards me. It's only in my mind that I synthesize right, the different appearances and have the idea watch, which I then attribute to these different appearances. So the only way in which I can really understand this thing is when I set aside my everyday interaction with it as watch, and I start seeing it as it actually is, a series of appearances which occur, as Husserl says, in adumbration and only I synthesize in my mind. Now, Marion takes that up in a similar way, but with faith. Look, in your everyday interaction, you may say that, see, the host is just a piece of bread, but you can perform a kind of phenomenological reduction, which is taking on the eyes of faith in which you can see it not as it appears in its everyday interaction, but as it actually is, right? As this saturated thing, as this sort of uh, Eucharist. Does that make sense? Is that a way of unpacking it for you? According, again, that's Marion's way of doing it. Sue? I'm wondering how the um, background viewpoint that you have to have <coughs> is in the case of that analysis of the host, say, your perception of it. I wonder how that uh, figures into the perception of the beggar, and I wonder how it fits into the phenomenolo phenomenological program. Okay, along these lines, but phenomenology started out as descriptive psychology, as you know, it was highly scientific, dry, careful, endless um, studies of color perception, for instance, the sort of thing that is now done by psychologists, not by philosophers particularly. But that's how it started, and I think um, in the beginning, at any rate, Husserl was on that end of things. Very careful, very scientific philosophy as a science. Mm -hmm. Very careful study of, of things like uh, sense perception and human experience and at that level. When you start talking about the bigger, like jumping way ahead to Lebanon or whatever, right. um, it's very complicated. The bigger, too, perhaps the Hindu, so they tell us, and this may be a prejudice, I have no idea, but it's true. The beggar to a Hindu is a person in an endless cycle of rebirths who's at a certain point, not the best point. But uh, what can we do about that? Everybody has their karma. Everybody reaps their actions. And we might hope for better for that person in the future, but it doesn't have the same claim on my attention. I don't think if I have that type of background um, scheme for stuff, uh, as, as it would if I'm looking at the beggar from a Christian standpoint, or probably from a Jewish standpoint, certainly in the Hebrew Bible, uh, we're told you were once a foreigner, you know, you you have to give, um, if he has no shirt, you know, you have to give your shirt and don't don't charge interest and so forth. Anyway, I'm 
with all those things. They're in the Hebrew scriptures, they're in um, the Christian Bible. So we have, because we've heard all this, and certainly the French are steeped in it, and it is. We've heard all this, and so here we are perceiving the beggar as somebody who has a claim on us because we have a certain background perspective. Now, how can you scientifically study this phenomenon um, without what Bob was talking about, the careful sociology, the careful psychology, and so on. That's what I'm not quite following. Okay, well, I think I, there's a couple different responses I'll have to your question, because it seems that there are a few, few different questions there uh, tucked into it. Uh, the first is, how can we do it without? Well, we wouldn't do it without. Of course you would do a careful uh, thing. And, and Levinas, uh, as, as does Marion, does detailed, uh, very careful studies of, of the way in which these things appear. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, many of Levinas' followers have gone on. One great example would be a guy named Alain Finkelkraut, who was a, a student of Levinas, uh, went on to work out this uh, in lots of different cultural traditions, uh, actually, the way that the response to, to the face occurs. So, of course, you have to do those things. Uh, if I remember correctly, Bob's question wasn't, um, how do you do it without? He goes, what, what makes uh, this still philosophy and not simply a, uh, a kind of uh, cultural anthropology. Um, of course, you need to, doing any ph phenomenology, especially phenomenology of, of human phenomena, requires a kind of cultural anthropology. But that's not all it is. It does more than that, right? So those are two slightly different questions. So of course you need to do those things. And we have to remember that Husserl himself didn't work out all of these things. He saw that as the work of his followers, right? Um, and indeed, many of them did. So for example, um, uh, the phenomenology of empathy, of course, was very famously worked out by um, Edith Stein, right? So one of his students, right? Uh, in the same way, Levinas saw himself as doing groundbreaking work and saw that uh, it would be up to the, you know, a lot of his followers to work the details of these things out and do the kind of detailed, concrete uh, philosophical anthropology. So you need you need both, of course. That's the first thing. The second one is we have to be careful not to collapse Levinas and Marion. Again, there are two different thinkers within uh, this French uh, uh, theological turn. They have two different ways of addressing these things. So again, whereas uh, uh, Levinas would say, look, it is universal. He would, absolutely. Everyone, uh, universal in the sense that everyone has this response to the beggar, right? Everyone has this response to the face, right? Uh, 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 Marion may say, ah, but only those uh, who see the beggar with the eyes of faith, or who, or who culture, oh, they only do it through their cultural alliteration of it. He may say it that way. So they would have two different answers to that that question. Uh, you know, for example, what's the difference between a Hindu response to the face and the Christian response to the face? Marion would say uh, they're seeing through different cultural alliterations, so they may have different phenomena may appear saturated to them. But the point is, in any case, for him. That it already implies that the background phenomena are saturated, and it simply is a matter of unlocking it through different cultural iterations. Right? Uh, for Levinas, uh, there are certain phenomena which, in all cases, are always uh, uh, working uh, in the same way. So they would have two different ways of uh, responding to that. Does that help? You don't seem satisfied. Well, um, Edith Stein's study of empathy is in that very careful scientific mold yeah. uh, of early Husserl. But what I'm, maybe just be what I'm hearing, and I should go read uh, Levinas and Mario and so forth, but um, it sounds to me as though it began very careful and scientific, and it wound up, you know, I'm not being fair here, and I understand that, but to make a point, a bit sketchy and literary. And yeah. But there's two ways we could respond to that. One, we could say, well, perhaps phenomenology has outgrown its origins, number one. Uh, so just because it started off that way certainly doesn't mean that that's the best way. Okay? Uh, but, but in any case, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Uh, I, I'd simply say, well, it still is very detailed. And I think you should, you should see it, uh, not only in Levinas, uh, who does very uh, detailed uh, work, but especially in uh, the followers of these people, just like Stein is working out what Husserl started. Uh, people like... Uh, um, um, so I only, only introduce you to, to the big thinkers here. So I mean, there, there are people like Alain Ficoucraut, who's working out Levinas' thoughts in a very detailed, very scientific, very culturally uh, uh, aware way and with multiple, multiple documentation. So Do you think it's a, a sort of closed conversation? No, not at all. In fact, I feel like that's what's so rich about this, is that it's a burst open to conversation. So uh, again, to cite Alain Ficoucraut, if I may, he's a talking head on French television. Uh, as was uh, Derrida in his time. Uh, 
So when uh, you know there was a big national uh, crisis or scandal, they got the philosopher on TV, uh, these guys, to, to help unpack it for them. So I, I, it's not closed at all. I, in fact, I'd say it's uh, opened the conversation such that uh, I think Kusra was a closed conversation in many ways. Uh, I mean, but but Gavinas and Derrida, if anything, invited people to the table who wouldn't have otherwise been there. Yeah. I, I'm curious about how you would give a phenomenological justification what you what you identify as the, the essential feature of the term. That is that when you were doing this, that it somehow um, something within the phenomena essentially pointed to something that was outside of phenomena. Uh, and that's what we would, that it would require for a, a real theological discussion. We wanted to talk about not just what people felt, but uh, we want we want our God to exist. Yeah. <laughs> so, how would you? What would be the difference on, on the one hand between the phenomena that would uh, indicate to you that it that it was pointing towards something beyond the phenomena? Uh, and a Heideggerian phenomena that re- that required a background beyond the phenomena, or uh, yeah. you know, or a Hegelian phenomena that pointed beyond it to an all-encompassing spirit that existed outside. Of it. Yeah, I should perhaps nu- be, be more nuanced about that. Again, the idea was to be a very general, which and being general and speaking in a general way, um, uh, oftentimes. Um, you know, the, the, the necessary danger of that is that you end up uh, covering over nuance. But of course, the big nuance there is there is nothing beyond a phenomenon. They take very seriously Heidegger and, and Husserl's claims, right? This is a core claim, I, I would say, to phenomenology. You, you knock out this noumenal idea of that which is beyond the phenomenon. So, what are we talking about when we're talking about um, uh, God then, right? Well, it's, it's a, 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 a God as these supersaturated phenomena. So, for example, Levinas was uh, very famously said, look, uh, every other is absolutely other. So what do I mean when I talk about uh, the other as uh, the divine? Uh, precisely this other who appears before me, the orphan, the widow, yeah? and yet not the orphan <coughs> widow, right? So it's this curious sort of deconstructing of these distinctions, right? Not something beyond, something imminent, and yet not fully imminent. Not able to be contained within the imminent. So it it introduces a kind of paradox, a kind of uh, aporetic uh, talk, which Derrida was very fond of saying. It's in this aporia, it's in this impossibility uh, that is the the divine, that that a real vital concept of the divine exists. yeah. How does uh, how does Husserl and Heidegger kind of handle Kant's notion of the sublime? That, as I understand it, was Kant's way of pointing directly at the noumenal and saying we can't know about it, but we can still sort of bump into it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you ask that. Uh, Levinas really doesn't talk about it. Um, Heidegger it, it wrote one book on the uh, problems of, of Kant, and he really also never addressed uh, the sublime. To my knowledge, Husserl never addresses uh, the sublime, although maybe in some of his later uh, unpublished writings and notes. Um, but I, I personally think that the sublime is a, a very rich way uh, of talking about that. The only problem with the sublime, though, again, is that for Kant, the sublime is, in a sense, yeah, it's the royal road, as it were, to the noumenal. For the phenomenologist, there is no beyond. So the sublime for them would again just be a phenomenal appearance which seems to break with the very uh, 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 understanding we have of the phenomenal realm. So for them, a phenomenology of the sublime would be a perfect way of talking about how uh, the infinite appears in the finite, as impossible as that may sound. Yeah, that's, I think that's the, the sublime is always a perfect example. And again, it would really support especially what Levinas sees as well. When you encounter these sort of curious phenomena like the sublime, Right? How much you're displaced, how much uh, you're all of a sudden made passive. You're no longer the active center of your own subjectivity or identity. You're thrown back on yourself in a sense. Yeah. I think I think the sublime is, is a wonderful way of, of, of teasing that out. Yeah. I, I would also add to that that w- in a sense it's a way of also uh, re-understanding Rudolf Otto's distinction of the noumenal. Right. Yeah. So uh, you have these experiences of dread and horror and fear. Uh, before the the infinite, and these are real phenomena. Yeah, anxiety. They take you over. It's not just a theory of you know of dread. It's dread is something that overwhelms. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not some ideal content. It's a very real phenomenon. And they'd say that phenomenon right there is the 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 sort of fecund appearance of God. Look at this. I am driving them from the room in droves. <laughs> uh, maybe well, this is a sign that we should. Yeah. yeah, I think I think we could bring the formal part of the discussion to a close. The informal part can continue. And uh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you.